So what I'd like to do here is to talk a little bit about a topic that Kenneth brought up last week, which is recorded. If you'd like to go back and watch it, you can. It's a great talk on the relationship between concentration and mindfulness and the distinction between them and practice. And I wanted to pick up on that thread, um, particularly of, of mindfulness, which is so central in Buddhist meditation practice. It's one of those pivotal teachings, probably why it's become such a huge craze, because it's very unique, very interesting. And I want to talk in particular about um, what we might call recollective mindfulness. There is, of course, the very um, kind of popular definition of mindfulness from John Kabat-Zinn about present moment awareness that's non-judgmental, moment-to-moment -moment awareness of what's happening, this metacognitive capacity to notice what's here. Of course, we distinguished that, Kenneth did last week, between that and concentration. And I think it's, it is really important, especially in the beginning of one's practice, to be able to distinguish those things, to be able to, to sort of notice, oh, I can be really mindful of what's present and not be judging it particularly, just be aware of it uh, and not be particularly concentrated or focused or loving or compassionate or whatever. It's not really about that. It's not about what you're experiencing. It's about noticing what's there. Um, here I want to share a quote from Dan Siegel where he talks about this as well uh, Dan Siegel's a uh, um, interpersonal neurobiologist and meditation teacher and here he talks about these two things I think in a different way where he, he talks about them in terms of noticing and sensing and he said there's a huge debate about what mindfulness is is it sensing or noticing. Intention on focusing on breath, he says, requires differentiation of noticing versus sensing. You use the noticing circuit to disengage the distraction and then use the sensing circuit to re-engage your focus. So I think there's a lot of ways this is similar to how uh, Kenneth spoke about it last week, concentration versus mindfulness, noticing versus sensing. The capacity to notice what's happening is exactly what allows us to keep, to bear in mind some instruction, something that we're focused on, like focusing on the breath or noting present moment experience or coming back to that mantra, whatever the focal point is. And then when we re-engage with the object of focus, we are not just trying to stay outside of it and observe it, but we're actually trying to engage with it, to sense it, to feel it um, from the inside, like we did in that meditation, feeling in the body. And so I think it's really helpful on the one hand to differentiate these two functions of mind, but then also once we've been able to do that and train our training in both, we can see how they can be linked back together. We can see how we, they can work together, concentration and mindfulness working in tandem noticing and sensing, working in a kind of virtuous feedback loop. Every time we lose sight of what it is that we're doing, we, we notice that that's happened. We remember. And this is another way of talking about mindfulness. It's very traditional ways to talk about mindfulness or to describe sati, the Pali word and the Sanskrit, as remembering or recollecting or another way this is translated sometimes is as non-forgetfulness. When we're mindful, we're not forgetting what's true, what we're doing, what's happening. Uh, Buddhist teacher B. Allen Wallace, he talks about mindfulness in a way that I really like, which is bearing in mind. With mindfulness, we're bearing something in mind. We're bearing in mind what's important right now, right? What is most important? Well, 
we have to to actually work with that question, we have to bear the question in mind. We can't just ask it once and then done uh, because because of our habits, because of our conditioning. And if we, if we were already enlightened fully, you know, we wouldn't have to do the work. Uh, if we were already getting it all the time, we wouldn't have to do any practice. We'd just be, be being a Buddha. But since it looks like most of us are still on the path to Buddhahood, then there's some practice. There's some things we've got to re recollect or remember. And here, I want to um, sort of expand on what Kenneth shared in terms of this metacognitive capacity to recollect and to remember what's happening right now. Um, because I think this is one obvious and really important way in which we, we do that. But there are other ways that we employ this recollective awareness. We also employ it not just to the present, but also to the past and to the future. Here's a quote from B. Allen Wallace in an uh, article called A Mindful Balance that I'll, I'll share the link with you all later, where he says, mindfulness includes retrospective memory of things in the past, prospectively remembering to do something in the future, and present-centered recollection in the sense of maintaining unwavering attention to a present reality. So I think this is really interesting. And for me, it really, it kind of opens and expands the definition of mindfulness to include more than we might consider if we're just taking that sort of present moment awareness as our kind of definition. It also, for me, uh, really does tie in with the whole notion of intention or volition in practice that we have an intention to do something right like like me asking you to to, ha to ask what is most important i'm going to invite you to continue coming back to that question throughout the session i'm just dropping it back in what is most important well to be able to do that you have to prospectively remember to do it you have to remind yourself okay i'm going to do this I'm going to ask this question, or I'm going to come back to the breath, or whatever the instruction is, whatever we're working with. That's a prospective mindfulness. We're intending to do it in the future. And then, of course, sometimes it happens. You know, we do. We remember, oh, I'm off in a fantasy. Let me come back. Let me come back to this. And, it, and, and also retrospectively, we can remember how... A session went. You know, we can reflect back on a period of practice or back on some activity in our lives, some exchange that we had with someone we love, for instance, or someone we don't love. And we can sort of reflect back on it and be like, okay, how was I being? Like, what was actually happening there? Um, we can employ retrospective mindfulness to reflect back on something and learn from it. I remember uh, in the early years of Buddhist Geeks, I had a conversation with this uh, Dharma teacher named Jason Sif who ran, ran a project called, I think it was the Meditation Project. And in his early um, days, he was a hardcore Mahasi practitioner. He practiced in the uh, Mahasi tradition of mental noting. And he got really super into that. And for whatever reason, at a certain point, he found it just wasn't working for him. Uh, there was something missing. It was dry. It, just, it, just was, it wasn't getting the results he wanted. And he ended up connecting with some different kinds of teachers who taught him a different method or different way of doing things. And he eventually by himself learned how to do what he called recollective mindfulness practice, recollective meditation, in that he would just sit without any intention beforehand of what I'm going to do with my time or energy. And he would actually just sit without any particular instructions. And after the session is over, he had the practice of reflecting back on what had just happened and journaling about it. So he'd use this recollective mindfulness capacity almost entirely instead of the prospective mindfulness of trying to keep in mind or bear in mind some instruction to follow. He'd just go into the meditation and then afterwards he'd reflect back and sort of say, what happened there? Recollecting what had occurred. And, and for him, that was a huge unlock. You know, that was a huge shift in his practice. And it worked for him to do that. Uh, and to me, it's like for, with this more broad and expansive definition of mindfulness, it's like, okay, cool. Like 
no big deal. Like there's different ways we can be mindful. We can be mindful after the fact. We can be mindful as we go into something. We can be mindful in the moment. All of these are legit ways to be mindful. And, and for me, what's so important about this or why I think B. Allen Wallace um, stresses this point is because if we just take that sort of mindfulness as just being present in the moment as our only way of, of understanding or working with mindfulness, it's kind of hard to link that back to the deep teachings on ethics that we find in the Buddhist tradition. Um, and because there is that sense of non-judgmental awareness, well, yeah, but we don't always want to be non-judgmental. <laughs> we actually want to hold in mind things that are important to us. Like I actually want to be kind and decent to people uh, and, and not like be an asshole. <laughs> you know, it's like my core ethical practice. Um, but how do I know if I'm doing that, you know, without reflecting back on it? Because in the moment, right, it's sometimes we miss, <laughs> we miss what's happening. Uh, we don't see. Uh, and so it's only upon reflection that we go, oh yeah, wow. Yeah, I was being really, I was being a big asshole there. <laughs> and sorry, you know. Uh, let me see what I can do now to learn from this and to to uh, to try and correct. And actually, you you see this very explicitly even in the in the earliest teachings on mindfulness, where you know it's not just mindfulness that's taught; it's right mindfulness or correct mindfulness or wise mindfulness. So this implies that there's like an incorrect or unwise way of being mindful. Um, you know, the, the example of the sniper is probably an interesting one. Imagine someone who's in war in an unjust situation. You could argue it's always unjust to, to hurt or harm other beings, but let's just be more nuanced here and say, let's, let's assume this is an unjust, um, war. And there's a sniper who's sitting there and being totally mindful of their experience as they sit with the gun, looking through the scope. They're not holding in mind or bearing in mind these deeper considerations. They're just doing what they're trained to do. And they've got excellent mindfulness and excellent concentration both. They're able to bring their attention fully to the moment, to know what's happening, to notice their surroundings, to keep in mind their directive, but they're missing something important, right? They're missing a deeper uh, tether to to our deep interconnection with one another. In the, four in the four foundations of mindfulness, the teaching called the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, there are four categories or four areas that one is instructed to be mindful of, to contemplate. And I always got confused about the fourth one, which is sometimes called the contemplation of mental objects. Because when I read what, what was there, it just seemed like a rehashing of like the entire early Buddhist tradition and all the lists. It's like, okay, you want to contemplate the five hindrances, the aggregates, the sense spaces, the factors of enlightenment, and the four truths. It's like basically Buddhism in a nutshell. You want to you want to be constantly reminding and bearing in mind these distinctions and these teachings. What we bear in mind determines the path that we're on. What we're recollecting determines where we go. Again, from B. Allen Wallace, he says, right mindfulness emerges only within the context of right view and right intention. And each of those, each of those schools of Buddhism has its own distinct interpretation of these latter two elements of the Noble Eightfold Path. In Theravada Buddhism, Right view focuses on the three themes of impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Right intention is a motivation for practice based on the recognition of the nature and causes of suffering and the yearning to gain irreversible liberation from all mental afflictions that lie at the root of suffering. In Mahayana Buddhism, he says, right mindfulness is practiced together with the view of emptiness, dependent origination, and Buddha nature, with the intention to achieve perfect, enlight perfect enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Without such a view and motivation, it is said that the practice of mindfulness and all related forms of meditation will not lead to Buddhahood. In each of those cases, mindfulness takes on a distinct flavor, just as it does if it's practiced with a materialistic worldview and a mundane motivation that is simply to relieve stress 
and find greater happiness in this lifetime alone. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is what we're bearing in mind really matters and how we're viewing our practice really matters. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, I think Kenneth and I both, we uh, tend to think that the Mahayana path is pretty fucking awesome. You know, that uh, that doing this for the sake of all beings um, really has an expansive and is uh, in some ways just morally better uh, than trying to, which is, again, it's fine, but trying to just seek one's own freedom. And I see this really in developmental terms as well. Like it's a natural unfolding or development to actually um, to move through these different views and to open uh, and to expand. So from that point of view, it's okay wherever you are, whatever the view you're taking, so long as you continue to work with that and continue to open, continue to consider maybe there's more that I'm missing. What is most important? I don't know. Let me see. This question can shake loose our firm conviction or faith that we know why we're doing this and what we're doing, which can be helpful. It's not helpful to do that all the time, but it's helpful some of the time to ask, remind ourselves, oh, what is most important? Why am I doing this? Like, <laughs> really? I know I'm, I'm like, I hear all your ideas and I, I get that. I've read these books. I know, but like, why am I really here? Why am I doing this? What is most important? 